Hello, friends, and welcome to The Reset Show, episode number 12. So today's theme is people and planning, and we are delighted to be joined by Adam Gibson, who is a global leader in workforce planning, creator of the Agile Workforce Planning Methodology, and author of the five-star rated book, Agile Workforce Planning, very recently published by Kogan Page. We'll come to you in a moment, Adam. Uh, thanks too to my co-host today, Belinda Ganaway from Fathom XP, and our producer, as always, Katie Austin from People Lab. And we are, of course, regular viewers will have spotted that we are normally accompanied by our third co-host, co Emma Bridger, also from People Lab. But um, Emma was invited to deliver a talk today for the National HR Conference. So that's where she is at the moment. She'll be back next time. Further thanks are due to our live studio audience, the select, the elite few that have joined us today, who of course get the opportunity to post questions and interact directly with our guest, Adam. Um, and you are all very welcome. Thank you for joining us from the comfort of your own home. And thanks too to you, the viewers on YouTube and the podcast listeners. We are delighted to welcome you to another show. If you are new to The Reset Show, where have you been? Uh, welcome. Here's some brief background to put you in the picture. The Reset Show is a place to bring together our amazing network of talented, passionate professionals, really to figure out what happens next and to make the most of the opportunity that The Big Reset presents. We have had, it's fair to say, an extraordinary program of guests so far, including the wonderful Perry Timms, who is here in the audience today, uh, from many diverse disciplines. And we are delighted today to have Adam Gibson with us. So I'm going to hand over to Belinda now to get the conversation started officially. Thank you. Um, yeah, this is the point where we just do a little connection to, to, to why we've invited this guest on. Um, so for me, it's a really interesting connection. So we, Emma and I have, have got a new book coming out with Kogan Page in March on employee experience design. And Adam is a fellow Kogan Page author. So that, that's our connection, as is Perry Timms, actually, who is also on the call, as, as Justin's just said. So it's a bit of a Kogan Page love fest at the moment. Um, so Adam, I'll kick off with a, a nice easy question for you. Um, well, I guess before we get started, is there anything about you that we've not said that we should really know? Um, I, I, I think one one interesting one is that I started writing the you know when I started writing the book and I was well into the throes of the book um, and I thought what it would be like at the point I was publishing I hadn't anticipated that actually my priority would be a five week old daughter um, who actually is is now everything everything that I've got going on is now a, now a little baby as well as a four year old who requires homeschooling so my uh, I'm slightly neglecting um, the talking about the book uh, much to much to the annoyance of Kogan Page I'm sure. <laughs> Well, we're here to rectify that at least for the next hour anyway. So thank you for sharing and lovely news on the new baby, which is a tremendous um, thing to achieve in lockdown. So you, you, I know, I mean, it's not just in the last few weeks, you've had a really exciting um, life, but I know that, you know, you've had a really exciting life all the way through um, with many years in, in, the, in the military. So I guess I'm, I'm, really, I'm, I'm really curious to know what excites you about the whole field of, of workforce planning. Um, I think what it's it's a field that I kind of I, I kind of fell into um, my the, my background in the military wasn't around people but I, I later took on some roles about people and it was naturally about that planning aspect of we couldn't really achieve the things we wanted to achieve with people unless we were doing that that detailed planning and so at the point at which I left the military that's that's what I continue to expand into that idea of um planning the planning the workforce but indeed doing it in organizations that meant you couldn't sit there plan once and leave it because the natural thing that we all experience is that everything changes the outside world changes your plans within the organization change lots of things lots of things happen that um that means you need to adjust and flex 
And so that's why I've, uh, that's that's the thing that's really excited me about it is that I realised that when we do this in the right way, in a way that means not only you thinking about this in advance, but you're thinking about this constantly. This can then become the engine room of everything. It becomes the engine room of HR. It becomes the engine room of, of you know, if you've got an organisation where most of your assets are people, where most of what you do is is centred around people becomes the engine room of the entire organization and that's what's really continued to excite me about workforce planning and the possibilities that it can bring for organizations yeah love it thank you it's interesting because this is a field that i know really very very little about but um sort of dipping into into your book what i could really see is that it, it actually almost the title is kind of it takes you down a certain mental path if you like but actually what you're describing is an awful lot less mechanistic and an awful lot more human than probably I anticipated. So I'd love to explore some of that. But let's start with a basic question, hopefully, for those uninitiated like I was. What even is workforce planning? Uh, well, quite simply, um, it, is, it is an approach of um, aligning people to the, the objectives that an organisation has. That's simply what it's about. Um, there's, it comes down to this idea of creating the right workforce. Now, the right workforce is actually a lot, you know, is a lot more of a deeper concept when you start thinking about the connection of right capabilities. And when I talk about right capabilities, I'm stepping away from this older approach of right people, right skills, because it is broader than that. Um, firstly, because um, having worked at, in both the military and in the police, the workforce does include dogs and horses. So we have got to think about people, but for all organizations now, robots are becoming part of the workforce. We need to recognize it in that kind of way. So I think about it this broadly, more broadly in terms of capabilities. Um, and that, that's therefore the connection of what are the skills, the things that people have practiced that results in an outcome. What is the knowledge? What are the things that people have readily available within their head that allows them to come to action? But then the other facets of that. So what's the um, what's the environment? Um, do you have the right environment to allow you to access to to bring things to bear? And that's why I take this this view of um, we've often talked about competencies. Competencies is is something that theoretically you could do. It's just a combination of things within you. Capability can only be brought to bear within the organisation. And therefore, we need to think about that connection of the things that we have inside us and how that then connects into the workplace. Because I think we'd all recognise there's things that we know that we could do. But if we get bad technology, um, if we've got, you know, a toxic work environment, if we've got a horrendous boss, we can't do those things. Um, but equally, a great environment can mean that things that we could do that we think we can do all right at actually means we can really excel and produce things well beyond what we expected. And so all of those things together is that concept of capability. What's our mindset? What's our physiology? What's the environment and how those then connect together with this idea of this older idea of skills and knowledge, because it is much broader. It is absolutely and just you know even when you start introducing words like mindset in, into the equation it's, it takes me to a different completely different area than I anticipated workforce planning would would be about and um, and then obviously you've got this beautiful word agile yes. um, and I know that this this is you know this is your methodology now agile is used a lot um, uh, and and I, I really like the way that you describe it the sort of four components that, that you describe in the book but rather than me expressing it why don't you tell us what what does agile mean for you and, and then what is agile workforce planning um so it's about it's it's really about taking something that lives um the the older approach of workforce planning was really about a linear process that results in a plan um a plan by itself is useless and the thing that many people have found challenging about workforce planning is unless it translates into a workforce, it's just a bright idea and anyone can come up with bright ideas. So this is about creating something that is constant and living and therefore results in the workforce. The plan is simply a stepping stone 
to the result of creating creating the workforce. What makes it agile is that way of thinking about this. Um, firstly, thinking about this in a way that I think surprised a lot of people um, reading the book is, uh, and particularly when you contrast it to um, other books that have been written on it, this isn't simply a fill out this spreadsheet, fill out this document, do this and do that, do, do that. This is very much more about a mindset and a foundation of thinking about organizations, about people, about systems and how those things, how those things come together. So we think about it in a different way. Um, that means that the methodology and the thinking about this is more important than a fixed process of data point, data point result. Um, it's something that means that rather than um, trying thinking that you've got to do a big bang across the entire organization, we can start small, start with something that's 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 more comfortable or start with something that is really going to demonstrate the value. Start with the areas of the organization that are really going to make the biggest impact if you can plan this and then gives you an, an opportunity to not only um, grow that plan by adding more workforce segments to it but equally it allows you to do things um it allows you to do things in a way where you can iterate that plan because one of the things that people will say is let's take covid as an example the future is uncertain how can we possibly plan well it is um but it doesn't mean that you don't plan at all what it means is you can create a plan recognize the things that there is less certainty about and prepare to be flexible about those things. It's the same as if you were to go on, if you were to go on a car journey to, you know, perhaps to a place that that you don't know about. Um, you'd you'd at least try and know where you were going. And if you are, if you're a bit old school, you might be looking at it on a map. I've very much grown up in a in a sat nav generation, um, so follow it, you know, largely follow it slavishly. But I've got to find out the postcode for where I'm going, put it into the sat nav, and that's the, you know. I work out how long it's going to take, make sure I've got enough fuel and the things that I'm going to need for the journey. And if the road is blocked on the way, I don't just sit there in the car, continuing to drive at a barrier and getting annoyed about it and saying, mm, the plan. Well, I work out another way, another way around it. That's what we all do as humans. And I think that's, it's one of the things I've really tried to bring through the, through the book is that there are things that we do in business that we don't do as people. And there are things that there are there are ways of doing business and ways that we think about things that have kind of evolved as that's that's just simply how business works. That that's how functions operate. But when you think about what we do as people, we do entirely the opposite. And if we start thinking more about um, um, and things that are more natural, more human to us, that does tend to be more agile in nature. Actually, a lot more possibilities exist. Love it. Thank you. Justin. Oh, yes. As always, my head is buzzing. <laughs> Thank you, Belinda. Um, this is what happens, Adam, when, when we get someone like you on the, on the call. Um, uh, 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 suddenly, so many avenues uh, of conversation open up, and it's my job to make sure that we cover off as many as we can. Uh, with the correct level of detail. I've been reminded by of uh, the quote, I'm sure everyone here has heard it already, but being a military of military background, I think it was Eisenhower, was a General Eisenhower who said famously, planning is essential, but plans are pointless. <laughs> um, and I'm reminded that's kind of what you're talking about, isn't it? It's like, uh, yes, this is the process we have to go through. And then we also, to, to use the other one, no plan survives contact with the enemy, which yeah in this context is life yeah um so um i'm going i'm interested to bring in perry here i know perry you've just popped a comment in the chat so rather than reading it out I, I'm, I'm going to invite you to jump on and um join the conversation so thank, you. Perry. thank you justin thank you adam yeah such is uh, the rhythm of the reset uh, show that that's what we do. Um, so I'm by, um, I guess, uh, identification and HR professional, Adam, um, and I've seen workforce planning held really tightly by HR. Um, and uh, I've kind of come to two conclusions about why that is. One is that HR don't want to let it go. They want to own it. And the other is that the business doesn't know what to do with workforce planning. And so HR has to own it because the business is deferring it and stepping back. Um, who do you think owns it? Um, 
so it's interesting it's interesting i think that it's, it's useful to sort of understand that in the concept of what you know how, how would you think about its ownership so i see workforce planning as existing over three time horizons it gives you an indication of who who gets involved in this kind of stuff so the first time horizon is that that we might call resource management resource planning uh, workforce management it's the thing we we do in year now who does that well, line managers do that. They've done that, you know, Karen's off sick. Who's going to cover her work? We, so it, that is naturally done at that level. In bigger organisations, it's got, you, you might have a scheduling or planning function who are creating those rotors or schedules. And that normally sits within business operations. Um, and I've not seen organisations or very few organisations where that connects naturally into HR. It's often completely di um, divorced. The next horizon is then the what do we do next financial year? Often owned by finance because it's part of the natural budgeting, budgeting process. So they will not often take ownership of that. Um, the better organisations, they do that in collaboration with HR. The worst ones, finance will do it in splendid isolation and go, there's your number. The longer term, the strategic end of, you know, two, three, you know, however many years down the line is often then HR territory. Um, so fundamentally, then, if you think about that, those things have all got to work together. Um, it therefore becomes something that's got to, that I, I believe has got to be um, owned by the place where they can create the effect. So if they don't have the tools to be able to create the outcomes, then they shouldn't own it. So let's take the first horizon. They largely have the tools, and when it's owned by business operation, they largely have the tools to be able to deal with it. it it's the right place. The next financial year sat with finance, a bit of a difficult one. Um, often finance naturally do have the power because they're setting the budgets, but it can create some frictions. And so I definitely think there needs to be more join up in that territory. The longer term, um, yes, it is. It normally sits within HR, but here's the challenge: uh, my the approach that I've created um, differs very much from traditional approaches because of the first step that we do as part of action planning. Once we've worked out what the gap is between what we have and what we need, what we need, and what we will have, and what we will need, the first step is demand optimization. And that's not what business is often done. So one of the things that, as well as having a baby over the Christmas period, um, I also moved house. And one of the things I, I did whilst moving house is exactly the same as what you will have all done, is I've taken a lot of trips to the recycling centre. Lots of trips to back and forth to the tip. Why? Because I have accumulated things over time that I no longer need. Um, and I've got a finite amount of packing boxes. I've got a finite amount of removal vans, finite amount of space in the in the new house. Um, now, the approach that businesses often take, which is what happens, is there is that master servant relationship between the business and HR. They, the business often don't take the trip to the tip. They say, just give me more people. G effectively, get me more boxes, get me more removal fan vans. I don't want to take a trip to the tip. But we all as people take the trip to the tip. So that's the start point for things where before we then start going right now, let's recruit. Now let's go to contractors first, take a look at that demand and say, how can we optimize it? What can we do within the organization that will that will change things? It might involve some org design, which can be HR territory. It might involve um, complete changes of systems, operating models, processes which is often operational territory and HR doesn't have the ability to step into. And once you've optimized it to the best extent you can, now let's look at bots. Let's look at automation of tasks. And only once we've done that, should we then be looking at how do we now align people to it? Why? Because people are, are the most precious resource. So let's find them the best kind of work, the work that really adds value, rather than just creating dreadful processes and going, just bring me people, just hire people who we can bring in, can be utterly miserable, but at least work gets done. That's not the great way of doing business. So that's very much the approach that I take about it is if we can, if we can give HR the tools and the authority to be able to do those things, 
HR is the right place for it. If not, it's got to sit at a, it's got to sit at a more senior leadership level to try and create that bridge across the organisation. Hallelujah. <laughs> No, seriously, lots of good. I mean, I'm really encouraged to hear you say about what what do we stop doing, what do we get rid of, what can we purge, because uh, that that far too few uh, occurrences where that happens. And you're right, it's just people saying, "Give me more," or "Stack it differently." And it's like, yeah. no, get rid. So uh, I'm totally with you on that. And that word optimization is a word that keeps popping into my head too. So I'm with you on that. Thanks for that. Thank you. Great question. Brilliant. Thank you. Love that question. Um, and everybody on the call, obviously, if you do have questions, do please continue to add them to the chat. So thank you for that, Perry. Um, oh, God, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm boring myself with this phrase. Extraordinary times, extraordinary times. We're living in extraordinary challenging. We know. Let's not go there. What? Not, I'm not quite sure how I want to phrase this question, because it's not what challenges are organisations facing when it comes to workforce planning, because that we can make a good stab at that. But it's like, it's the process of doing it or workforce planning, even as, as a discipline or as a thing, is that coming under the spotlight as a, as a kind of like, well, this makes no sense anymore, let's not bother doing it. That's my sorry, really ill-formed question. You're nodding, and I'm hoping it made enough sense. Yeah, so I think so. Uh, so I think there's two parts of it. So I think that lots of, lots of organizations are recognizing that things are now so fundamentally different, they need to think about it. And if they're thinking, they're planning. It might not translate into a glossy brochure, which is great. Um, this is about creating something that can be done, um, not something that can simply be published. Um, so organizations are starting to think that way and recognize it. Mm. Equally, a lot of organizations are saying, well, COVID has, done, has been so much of a disruptor how can we how can we possibly plan um you know the future is so uncertain uh, how can we how can we possibly plan um and it's a and it's an interesting again it's one of those things that uh, that businesses um often do and i think we 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 often do it, it, it it's something that that happens too often is we look for difference what we're doing is saying well what is going to be different about the future so much is going to be different about the future Therefore, we can't plan. I'd say look at it a different way. What's going to be similar? And actually, when you take that step back and think, what are the things that are actually going to remain constant about the future? And let's plan. Let's just plan on those. If you can think about the things that are going to remain constant, plan on plan on those things. And then everything else you can, you know, you can sort of, you can make assumptions about but you know plan based on making broad assumptions of well these are the things that are very likely to remain constant over what particular time horizon so you know let's think about the next three years fundamentally you know the robots aren't going to take over so within the next three years we are going to be needing to to use people um so let's start thinking about that human dimension of work because those things are going to remain a constant no matter what happens in the future suddenly a whole load of you can plan things when you start thinking about that way you can start um, you can start making those plans but we too often go straight in to find the difference and say it can't be done yeah i, I love it thank you and it sort of reminds me of, of your earlier point about where do you get started start start small and build and plan and it's like you can't it's like not boiling the ocean isn't it is that point very much. I, I, I use the I use the phrase "don't you know not boil the ocean" often uh, within the book and within life. It's you know start with start with a bit that's small, um, start with a bit that's going to make a difference, um, start with a bit that you that you know well. Um, start there because you will know you will already know some of this stuff. Start with the bits that you know, the bits that you can expect are going to continue. Plan. Start to plan on that basis. And once you've got the once you've got the foundations of it, then you can start casting your mind to you, okay, what are the more what are the more trickier elements? And it's often that that leads people into in, into sort of some of the confusions over technology. Um, and what people there are there are um, there are a lot of tools that you can use for workforce planning, and I'm very much technology agnostic. Um, and one of but, but the most important thing to recognize is there is no technology 
system that exists today where you can press a button and it will spit out a strategic a, a workforce plan that looks out over multiple years you can spit out something which basically cuts and pastes today and projects it forward you can even get tools that will give you you know a few different scenarios of that but there's nothing that's going to lead you to plans around um you know detailed you know detailed employee engagement or comp or uh, reviewing your your systems and approaches nothing's going to lead you that way because the technology the technology doesn't do that because people have often thought about the difference uh, it, this that the future is completely different they simply think well this is the future is completely intractable therefore i need um fantastic technology that will do these things and often get disappointed by it when you start thinking about what's the same you can you can then easily pick out what are the smaller things on which there is uncertainty and that's where technology suddenly becomes useful because you can pick specific technologies that will allow you to answer what you now have as specific business or workforce um, uh, issues rather than simply going i literally have no idea and you're left into the hands of vendors um who will tell you who would tell it for you um so that's where i very much say you know look at this uh, you know look at this from a broader perspective of what what can you expect is going to be the same and start from that position Adam, thanks, thanks very much i i'd like if i may to loop back uh, a few moments ago, uh, you, well, there was a question by Liz, uh, which was prompted by something you were talking about a few minutes ago. And um, uh, Liz says, uh, it's provocation really, sounds like business process re-engineering. Uh, how is it different? Um, so I think this is, uh, you know, I, I, I think it's a great question. Um, this is about looking at business processes in a different way. Um, because I think there's the there's what people have said is is an ideal, but then there's the reality of how businesses operate, and this is what I've tried. This is what I've aimed to do with the book. Very much take this as what is it that happens in real life within organisations, um, and a lot of this is taking um, is taking some existing tools that people will recognise, but applying them in a different way and in a diff and in a different sequence. And that's what starts to open up, open up the possibilities of things. Um, I, th um, I think a lot of the, a lot of the more, a lot of the approaches that organisations have been taking um, still lead you to some of the same things happening over and over again, which is, you know, for example, um, <clears throat> a, you know, you have a lot of great, you know, you have a lot of great ideas that's you know with there's a lot more recently about you know organizations create a purpose everyone gets behind that um an organization will then have these clear objectives they will have a strategy that seems to make sense and then a budget then comes in part way through cuts it off and then there's now a disconnect between what an organization is trying to do and the way that work is done and it's the biggest source of friction failure that i see within organizations that what they want to achieve and the way they try and achieve it do not marry up and it's often it's often finance it's not i'm not blaming finance it's often the budget that restricts it because it the the two don't connect um and biz traditional business processes haven't been able to overcome that that issue of tension that you know it is it's natural for you to have an objective that that it, that is a stretch on paper. That's absolutely natural, but the tensions are breaking, um, and business process you know, the the standard approaches around business process aren't remedying that issue. Um, they are, you know, we are still ending up with um, organisations who are struggling to be able to achieve the things that they want to achieve, and you've got um, people. Who are being um, who are disengaged and are being broken by um, organisations who are doing this, and you've got some who are very successful, um, and even those you've still got pockets of people who are going, I don't want to be here anymore, um, 
business process hasn't been able to overcome that. So this is very much around taking taking uh, taking a different approach that uses some of those techniques. Um, you know, this isn't throwing out a whole load of things from the past that didn't work. There's a whole load of things there that's that's really good. But it's about applying these things in a different way with a different way of thinking. Lovely answer, and and it ties nicely with your analogy or. Is it an analogy? Is it a metaphor? I don't know. <laughs> Grammar nerds can tell me um, of the, the recycling, isn't it? Of actually looking at what, what you have and going, so this is what we have. How can we use it uh, in, a, in a more effective way or in a different way, rather than like you say, just either just leaving it loitering somewhere in the background or, or getting rid of it. Um, Adam, I'd like to, if I may, I've, I've really enjoyed, first of all, um, and I think Wilorna has commented as well. I really enjoyed your car journey uh, metaphor. I'm going to say it's a metaphor, and and the recycling. Um, really lovely use of, uh, of of bringing telling story to bring the subject to life, which is something that I'm passionate about. And you've talked about things that we do in our personal life that make sense that we don't do in business. We've had a couple of nice examples of those. Could you give us an example of things maybe that we do in business that we don't do in our personal life that we could um apply so from you know uh, from what from, from transferred learning if you like because the, the part of the show the show the show's appeal is that we we are joined by hr professionals like like perry and some of the other colleagues and we're also joined by people who just have an interest in stuff um so it's nice to get both an organizational and a personal perspective so can I ask you to pick up on that? Well, what, what works in organizations that we don't do in our, that we don't do in our personal life? Yeah. Um, an interesting one, I don't think it's one that, I don't think it's one of the questions I've, um, I've ever considered. Um, there's probably, there's probably something there about, um, about taking, about taking a, a more systems based approach because we don't tend to do that in our in our personal lives indeed organize you know some organizations don't take that approach um, but I think where it happens it only I only ever see it happen within the field of work um, and it's probably because um, it is more apparent in the workplace it's more apparent um, what the what the system is it's more apparent that you've got um, we call them stakeholders. So we recognize that we recognize people as stakeholders. We recognize people as, as clients. Um, we recognize to an extent what drives work, what drives the things that we do. Um, and then when we sort of, well, those who are fortunate enough to be able to then switch the laptop off, off on a Friday and return to things on a Monday, um, the weekend isn't the governed the same way. And I don't think we recognize, we don't think about our family and friends as stakeholders. Um, we, you know, we, we don't, we don't think, you know, we, we probably don't think of, um, I often don't think of my four year old as a client, um, but he is an exceptionally demanding client <laughs> um, who, um, um, for whom I charge no fees, so he's very much getting a good deal. Um, but I think we don't we don't tend to think about it that way, and it probably then frames um, frames to an extent the way in which we we think and recognise things. Because I think we'll often find we get to we get to Friday night, sorry, we get to Sunday night. And we think, well, where's the where's the weekend gone? Um, and whereas we might be great at managing our time within the workplace because we kind of know where things are coming from and we know the correct approaches and the dynamics with, with, to which we, which we push back. And then in our personal lives, um, we don't. And some, you know, some might be great at it. Some just might find themselves um, overwhelmed by those things. And, and so perhaps one of the things that can help us personally is taking that, is taking that more systems approach to things um, to, to review our own lives in that way and perhaps um, carve out a little bit more, more, more free time, or at least recognize, um, what is the relate, what is the genuine nature of the relationship I have with X, Y, and Z. Um, and, and, you know, and for those who perhaps have more, um, uh, more difficult relationships within their personal lives, perhaps allow them to sort of recognize why is it that they feel a particular way, 
about those relationships if they were to be thinking about it of if this was in the workplace and the you know and what's similar within the workplace that I can equate it to how would I be dealing with it that way Oh, thank you so much. I'm going to pass back over to Belinda in a moment. But as I asked you the question, I just wanted to say thank you for that. Adam. you saw lots of lovely reactions from from the listeners. And uh, it, and it's a point that I think applies in so many ways. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm always talking about, you know, the, the notion of work life balance or the work life split or who you are at work and who you are at home as being just as being a nonsense because we are people in a room with other people or as we are now people in a room virtual room <laughs> or a real room yeah. um, and when we can join together those two worlds and the best of the best practice for both of those worlds of course everything does become uh, more, more it's smoother isn't it and and there are there are so many things that if you ask that question in the other context you go oh i mean i had this recently with with my kids who are 12 and 10 suddenly i was running leadership training and i suddenly had a moment of insight and you know and i spoke to my ex-wife and i said you know effectively we are like there's, there's a dotted line here we're both line managing these yeah. kids together and you and i need to have a kind of you know, we need to have a plan here. Um, so, um, so thank you very much for that. Um, uh, lovely stuff, and I think that's probably prompted questions in all of our heads of how can we apply the stuff that we do here to the stuff that we do there. Um, but back over to you, Belinda. Thank you, and um, Adam. Thank you so much for running running with that question. That was such a humdinger of a question. I didn't know where Justin was going with it, and you picked up and ran with it. And as Justin said uh, on the on the screen, I could see people's faces going, "Wow." Yeah, and actually I do um, organizational relationships and systems coaching, so you're very much stepping into that world and that territory. So yeah, sort of looking at the relationships and the nature of relationships and the stresses and demands of those relationships around, around us. And I'm definitely going to start charging my kids for lunch. Um, <laughs> it's about to they start to bang. And lots of similar thoughts in the, in the chat from that. So on a so for a related theme, it's about the individual, sort of us as individuals and thinking back to your book. I love the blueprint for agility that you shared in the book. And two things again really jumped out that sort of surprised me just seeing that on the first dip into your book at least, which is one, the focus on the individual and also this the massive focus in the book on learning. So in this show, we always try and straddle, you know, as Justin said, if I'm working in HR or, or culture, or whatever, there are clear lessons and, and things that we can take from the show. But for those of us that are on the show that aren't in that world and just thinking, actually, particularly with the book, what, what's this, what's in the book for me as an individual? What lessons can I take? I'm wondering, sorry, a little bit more context. We had um, Heather McGowan on recently, the author of The Adaptation Advantage, and we were talking about the, you know, what it means for individuals in terms of the need to grow and learn and so on in this sort of ever-changing world. I'm just wondering what lessons you would like to, to sort of give to individuals reading your book, reading as an individual as opposed to an HR or workforce planning professional. Yeah, I mean, most, uh, I'm, I'm trying to take a human dimension in, in the book. Um, the aim was that there is, there's been a lot of books that talk about workforce planning, but nothing that teaches you how to do it and gives you the, gives you the guidance. And so when you start thinking about it, if you're taking a linear A, B, C, you know, do A, B, C, D, then, um, then actually the book becomes rather limited. But thinking about it in the way that I've created it, to think that way, this is about a way of thinking. And so it requires a, an understanding of, a, you know, a broader framework of thinking about how businesses operate, how things connect together, um, and what drives what, how is value created? And this is no matter what part of work you're in, that this relates to you. You know, everyone is, you know, everyone is in a role where they are generating value. Or at least everyone has an aspiration that they're in a role where they're generating value. Um, and that's what that's what all this is about, is how do how do we do everything that we need to so that value is generated at the back end? Because why do we need value? Well, value, without value, you don't have an organization. If you don't have an organization, then none of this exists. We like to, we like to sort of take, we often sort of take a, 
um, a view of, oh, no, this is this is absolutely about people in splendid isolation of everything else, but without creating value, you know, an, org, you know, an individual is simply jobless. Um, so everything, you know, no matter what role you're in, no matter what you do, um, even if this is within your own personal life, everyone is doing things where they're trying to create value. Mm -hmm. And this is, and that's what the entire book is featured around the way of thinking about things so that the end result is value and not simply um stakeholder value that's clearly got to be part of it not simply about value to shareholders but a broader concept of creating value based on what is it that we want to be as in people what do organizations want to be what is it that they're trying to do um, and so very much I, I sort of draw from the Simon Sinek view of absolutely start with why the organizational why and your own personal why. But this is then it's almost a framework of having then created the what have you know, if you've read Simon Sinek and you've now got a why, what next? And this book is very much a well, this is the what next. We um, obviously the, the research show is called, called the research show and we, we really love to take this time to sort of think of well, this is an opportunity, this moment in time, um, you know, it, it, the, the silver lining of a pandemic, sorry, that might sound a bit clunky, but you, you know where I'm yeah. coming from. So, so if we if we got an opportunity to sit and pause and think about how do we do stuff this stuff better, it feels like this concept of value of doing something meaningful and worthwhile rather than just feeding the corporate machine or whatever you may be doing is a really good time to do that. Have you got any other thoughts on what this reset opportunity offers individual and organizations yeah i mean the thing that drives me amongst all of this is is the the passion to connect engage people with meaningful work and that's the thing that is lacking for so many people either there isn't meaningful work or the way that things up means that they they aren't engaged and clearly we want both of those things to happen um mm. and <clears throat> we've we, we've we've forgotten so many of the lessons now I, I joined the you know having left the army i joined the workplace um post 2008 financial crisis um so i hadn't gone through that as being in industry and experiencing that you know that that direct pain and shock of it um but i continue to be surprised of how much we've forgotten the lessons of that financial crisis that i've learned and i i I wasn't there in business at the time. Um, and, and one of the things that we did, particularly in the UK and the US, is we had a lot of cheap labor available. And rather than investing in making things better, we solved our problems by bringing in more people. Just put more people into it because people are cheap. Um, and and therefore, that's why we've got, that's why we had up to the, up to the pandemic the lower levels of employment but it's equally why we had such low levels over a 10-year period of capital investment we hadn't invested in learning we hadn't invested in making things better we hadn't invested in technology to the same way um and as the pan as the pandemic hit suddenly those things those things became a reality um and we have as people as people in organizations we've all had to pivot immediately to be you know to continue to survive um <clears throat> and and one of the things that i find I, I find interesting is um is that there is an opportunity to you know this is an opportunity to reset this is an opportunity to do things different um but again people are, people are holding tightly onto that insecurity about the future and one of the things i'd sort of say to everyone is the in the you know in our personal lives the pandemic has been um you know has, has been you know utterly destructive and it's and, and it has meant those of us in work again have gone through a lot of difficulty and challenge um, we found ourselves working far longer hours and it's been a lot more difficult than if things had simply continued the way we the way that they were but we've not put in that effort in the genuine expectation that the that our organization is going to collapse in the next three months or six months. We've genuinely put that effort in because we believe and we ho and we have hope that our organization will continue and succeed. So let's plan based on that hope. 
And that's the opportunity for reset. If we start to, if we've done all this on the expectation of hope, let's start to plan properly based on that hope. What a lovely combination of thoughts. I'm, yeah, really, really interesting stuff. I know there's some more questions in the chat, so I'll hand back to, to Justin to, to, to bring some of those up. Yeah, that was lovely stuff, um, Adam. Thank you. Uh, and some great comments in, in the chat. I love Will Orna's comment about the, the famous conversation with JFK and the cleaner. It is a lovely example of everyone adding value and there not being a hierarchy of how much value you add. Um, lo love that, Will Orna. Thanks for that. I'm going to jump back up to Perry. Uh, Perry, you had a... Let me just ask you to jump in and re yeah, rephrase your question in whatever way it feels. Nice. Okay. Uh, so I guess being an HR professional and interested in the same things that you are about people uh, getting meaning from their work, um, workforce planning does focus a lot on skills and knowledge. Mm. Increasingly, what I'm seeing is that we're missing a lot of human value through things they value that aren't in their competence stack. They're not in their job description, but they're things they want to do, like benevolence and compassion and creativity and all that kind of stuff that I put in there. Um, can you see a future workforce planning um, uh, system and opportunity uh, that that sweeps up that lost value because there there is always more people can give and we don't often line it up yeah and when i think about that concept of mindset which i see as a you know as, a, as, an, as an, an integral part of that capability it's that those those exact same things um you know that mindset you know, the mindset and values of um you know be you know being benevolent being compassionate um you know, when you start thinking about, um, you know, when you start thinking about concepts like um, creativity, um, it's loose enough for you to be able to go, I, I'd struggle calling this either a skill or knowledge. It's something that, um, I, you know, an element of it is intrinsic. I, you know, I'm sure it's something that can be developed. Um, you know, your ability to apply that creativity can be developed in the same way as a skill. Um, but it's very much something that you that 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 you have uh, that you have inside you, um, and you know which is which is a reason I can't paint. <laughs> so um, and those things are absolutely you know absolutely a source of value, um, and they are and they are a way that things can uh, things that can happen. Um, if you you know if we <laughs> if we took nursing as you know the profession of nursing for example. And we try to break it down into, um, you know, knowledge, skills, and experience. You know, how would you, how would you ever, you know, you'd be looking at a compassion of a, um, something ridiculous like, you know, ten years of experience in being compassionate. It'd be, it'd be utterly ridiculous <laughs> on the job spec. Um, but it's, you know, to be able to break it down, you know, it you wouldn't call it out as a skill. You wouldn't call it out as knowledge. So how would that appear? On, on a job description, on a job advert. But can you imagine nursing without it? And so there's absolutely a place for, for these. And, uh, you know, and I very much see it as that form, that is the critical, that's a critical component of capability. And we need to be thinking that way um, about, about our workforce. It's only when we recognize those dimensions that we really start to recognize where value comes from. Um, I, yeah, I think that's great. I also like systems where there is like some white space where people can mm -hmm. learn how to, um, I suppose, exercise those values and bring them into their role. And then that almost can lead them towards uh, a career option that's probably better suited for them. So I think work, workforce planning needs to be as tight as it can be for that optimization but with that little bit of looseness that helps people become who they're meant to be. So I'm with you. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you're you're absolutely right. This is you know the, the the things that we're trying to create are you know better organisations and and you know and and better and better people, better society, and that that can't simply come from a optimising things um, to the nth degree um, so that lives are miserable. And it's a, and it's one of the reasons why I talk about I talk about demand optimisation, but not workforce optimisation because I, it often pushes. It pushes thinking in a different way. Um, it's why we often think of, um, we talk about um, productivity as a people issue. And it's often not, um, you know, when we talk about the people issues of productivity, that's often 
they're a new starter and so they don't know yet how to do things um or you know there's an illness you know there's a there's a health issue or they they are just about to leave and you know and have lost all interest in trying to continue to perform in the way that they are everything else is typically the organization it's typically the systems that are the you know the main main impact around productivity and pro, you know and, and likely you know and, and therefore one of the reasons why again we've had these challenges around of productivity in the in the west over the last 10 years which uh, correlates exactly where we've taken this approach around not doing capital investment and instead just hiring more people cheaply and trying to do work that way oh adam you've just now now you've started um we we might we i think we'll have to have you back on for part two <laughs> Oh, thank you so much. And Liz, you'd be disappointed to know we're not going to get around to your second question. Uh, they do always say, leave them wanting more. <laughs> uh, we are definitely leaving us wanting more. And I'm sure, yes, well, Lorna's saying definitely need a part two. Um, Adam, absolutely heartfelt thanks from us all here for joining thank us. You. Thank you so much. It's been really uh, educational, entertaining, and, and inspiring, and thought-provoking. So all all wrapped up in a fifty-minute conversation. So uh, thank you, thank you, and uh, thank yes, you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Let's get chatting about it, part two. Um, thank you to all of you whose lovely faces I can see on the screen. Uh, it's been a delight to share this hour of our lives in the company uh, of Adam. We are back in two weeks time our next episode is going to be all about personalization at work and we are joined by rob baker who is the founder and director of tailored thinking um, an evidence-based positive psychology well-being and hr consultancy hmm why could we possibly have thought it would be a good idea to have rob on uh, very excited about that and i know emma's looking forward to being back to chatting to um, Rob. Following that, we will be revisiting this topic. So any of you who have been on this call, uh, including yourself, Adam, I recommend coming back. We've got very excited, have Natal Dank, who those of you who know, know, a pioneer in the world of Agile HR and people experience. She is joining us. And that will be the one after next. So that'll be Reset Show 14. Um, if you would like to be in the audience for the next live recording, uh, join up, sign up. Um, otherwise, we are, of course, delighted that you uh, continue to watch us um, post show on the various uh, watching and listening platforms. I think that is it. It is time for us to go. We wish you well. Thanks again to Adam. And we'll see you all next time on the Reset Show. Take care.